welcome everyone. Oh, let's jump right in and look at why branding and visibility are so critically important to your executive career. We are going to look at what branding is not as well as what it is. There is quite a bit of brand confusion, and so we are going to ensure that you know what authentic branding is so that you can leverage its power. Which brings us to point number three, why I believe branded visibility is so critically important to your career. And then finally, we will take a look at some tangible outcomes of having a strong, compelling, and visible brand. Okay, first, what branding is not. Rather than what you believe to be true, your authentic brand lies at the intersection of who you believe you are as it aligns with what others believe to be true about you. For example, if a CFO believes himself to be a visionary leader, but his team views him as a micromanaging control freak, who is he really? Getting honest, confidential feedback is critically important to understanding your brand perception. A recent article on CBSNews.com suggested performing a reputation audit by asking people closest to you for their honest feedback. I agree with the first part. Performing a reputation audit is critically important because you can't change what you don't know. I disagree that you can expect people who are closest to you to give you honest feedback face to face, particularly if they care about you. Most people sugarcoat honesty to avoid hurting others. The very best way to gather the feedback you need to understand your brand perception is with a 360 assessment that solicits internal and external confidential feedback. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Branding is not marketing, but certainly all of your marketing should flow from your authentic brand. I saw an article in which the author suggested that a resume be rebranded every time it was sent to a different audience. That's not branding. That's marketing. Knowing your authentic brand allows you to identify a clear target audience based on the key attributes, leadership competencies, and strengths you bring to the table, and that doesn't change. Neither is branding a facade that one presents depending on the audience. If you are one person in the office and a completely different person when you're with friends, then in at least one place, you're wearing a mask. Inauthenticity is eventually outed and can be extremely damaging to a brand. Let's look at Tiger Woods. I probably actually don't even have to say much more than that, but I will. He is someone who had an image, not a brand. And that shiny, wholesome image was shattered, and his career has yet to recover. Vanity should never be at the foundation of a brand. If you find yourself acting one way when you are out with friends and donning a corporate mask in the office, something is out of sync and will eventually catch up to you. It could very well be that you find yourself in the wrong company because of a conflict of values, and you ended up there pretending to be someone you really weren't. And that kind of situation is very wearing. Social networking is a tool to bring visibility to your brand. But just because you use social media does not mean that you are well-branded. It merely means that you are visible. The reality is that if you don't know your brand or understand branding, your message could be completely muddy or just as bad mixed. And neither of those are good for branding. To illustrate the power of social media, we'll take a look at two brands impacted by social media. Both have established highly visible brands. While one outcome is quite positive, the other is quite negative, and neither were in control of the viral messaging that is indicative of social media. When Tim Tebow led the Broncos to a record-breaking overtime win against the Steelers, 
Twitter and Facebook exploded within seconds. Twitter says 9,420 tweets per second. 9,420 tweets per second were sent after the win. And John 3.16 was the most searched verse on Google on January 8th, followed by Tebow and then Tim Tebow. And the flip side. A McDonald's Twitter campaign was supposed to reveal positive stories from McDonald's suppliers. However, the campaign went horribly wrong as the Mickey D Stories hashtag was hijacked by unhappy customers tweeting very unpleasant stories. Currently, McDonald's finds themselves involved in a tweet fight with PETA over the contents of its chicken nuggets. One account of the story said, and I quote, McDonald's marketing executives must be pining for the old days of buying only TV commercials, billboards, and other media that don't talk back. Now, in both of these extreme examples, social media was in control, not Tebow and not McDonald's, although McDonald's has since tried to control the message since it went south. It's imperative that when you are building your branded visibility in today's Web 2.0 world, you drive the message before letting social media take over. In the case of Tebow, his brand is highly visible and truly authentic. That does not, however, stop his detractors from spreading a very hate-filled message. For the average person, controlling the message, if it's authentic, is quite doable. And if you can control the first page of Google search results, then you, not others, are in control of your branded message. Remember, social media is merely a tool, and that tool can work for or against your brand. The elevator speech, which is used when you're talking at someone, say, at a networking table, is not your brand. However, if you use an elevator speech, it should be wrapped in your branded value proposition. An elevator speech has its limited place, but I am a big fan of who and do what statements that allow you to move the conversation from talking at people to engaging with them. And I'll plug a great book that you can read to learn more about those who and do what statements. It's Michael Port's Book Yourself Solid. And while the book is targeted to entrepreneurs, remember, when you're in a job hunt, you are selling yourself. Your value proposition is the proven value you bring to an organization, most effective when you are framed as a problem solver. Your brand is the way in which you deliver value. So think about it this way. Your value proposition is factual, tangible, and measurable. Your brand is emotional. So let's move to what authentic branding really is and go back to my opening statement. Your authentic brand lies at the intersection of who you believe you are as it aligns with what others believe about you. It combines that perception with your key attributes and value to an organization, which leads to your brand persona. And I'm going to give you a, a little visual to help you think about what this actually looks like. So other perception is pretty clear. It's what others think about you. And it could be a combination of rational and emotional attributes. Your perception, of course, is the self-assessment that you've done on yourself, and it too can combine the factual with the emotional. Your key attributes are really that list of both rational and emotional attributes, those things that people see in you. Um, they could be viewed through the lens of your strengths, could be leadership skills, and they combine to create what I call a brand persona. And we will talk about that in a minute. Um, they can be rational and emotional. And the resulting brand persona is also a combination of both rational and emotional attributes. 
And then finally, your value proposition, which, as we've talked about, is your proven ability to deliver value. It is foundational and therefore rational. And how you deliver that value, again, is the emotional piece. If the words emotional and rational have your head spinning right now, please stay with me. We're going to get in the weeds for a few minutes. But it's very important that you understand this concept because it is core to branding. And it will become clear, I promise. So we have rational brand attributes and we have emotional brand attributes. Rational brand personas are a collection of these key attributes. For example, honesty, integrity, loyalty, trustworthiness, devoted. Those are attributes that are valuable and foundational to what you as finance executives do. We use rational attributes all the time. Joe is the most honest plumber I know. Susie is the most reliable babysitter we've ever used. We all use them. In the world of finance executives, an example of a rational brand persona might be truth teller, somebody who brings impeccable honesty to the table, or rock, just as you would imagine, this person can absolutely be counted on. Rational brand personas are essential. No one will consider you for a job or hire you as a consultant without a base of solid, rational brand attributes. In fact, I would suggest that in the first elimination round, rational brand attributes in combination with your proven ability to deliver value play a major role. They are foundational to the success you have had in your career. On the other hand, Emotional brand attributes are those personality characteristics that get people interested in you. Things like quick-witted. I know, we're talking finance executives, but bear with me. Quick-witted, self-assured, colorful, quirky. They make you attractive and get people to want to know you. Examples of emotional brand personas might be world citizen, they're multiculturalists, they're worldly, they're flexible. Evangelists exude passion and enthusiasm. And charmers, they are extremely likable. Emotional brand personas that differentiate you from your peers and are relevant, attractive, and compelling to your target audience will help you stand out and reach your career or business goals. So let me try to clarify that a bit with a couple of concrete examples. Creator is typically an emotional brand persona. Now remember, a persona is a combination of attributes. Being creative is interesting and appealing. But if you are in any kind of a creative industry, creator is more of a rational brand persona because you absolutely need to be perceived as creative in order to even hold that kind of a position. Conversely, truth teller is most often a rational brand persona. But for finance executives and CFOs, being a truth teller could be an emotional brand persona, particularly today. Perhaps your CEO comes to you and wants to fudge a couple of numbers. A truth teller would be unable to do something like that. Or if he did violate his authentic core beliefs, his sense of impeccable, impeccable honesty would ensure that he didn't sleep very well for a very long time. It might even ultimately drive him to quit his job. Or perhaps in the course of job in interviews, it was made clear that the CEO was looking for a finance executive to do exactly what he was told. The company was hiring a team player and wanted someone who would do what he was told, whether it was right or wrong. A truth teller would flee at the first available opportunity. Here's a real life example of the merging of rational and emotional brands. One of my clients is a total brainiac. In his 360 assessment, he received comments like, 
brain power, one of the smartest people I know, intelligent, exceptional intellect, ability to dissect complicated tasks. Those are all rational brand attributes. His intellect is very much a contributor to his success as a finance executive. On the flip side, his emotional brand attributes were very revealing, full of energy with childlike curiosity and playfulness, noisy, powerful, at the forefront, and yes, quirky. One person described him as a bread baking machine. If he starts with something small, it will grow into something much bigger. Another said if he was a car, he would be a used BMW because while he would want the status symbol, he would want it cheaply. Spoken like a true finance guy, right? Words like quick-witted appeared 11 times, likable 20, enthusiastic 12, and many, many people said he was charming. He exudes personality, and he may be one of the most likable people I have ever met. His brand statement begins like this, a brain with personality. While it goes on to capture fully the how and the why of his brand, those four words completely capture the authentic essence of this very successful executive. And he's gotten a lot of mileage out of those four words use them on his business cards and in his email signature, he has carefully cultivated his brand as a charming brainiac. And I'll come back to him in a little bit. So if you've identified your emotional and rational brand attributes, identified your brand personas, and established your unique brand, now what? It's time to make your brand visible. Bringing visibility to your brand is what helps you to get noticed by the people who need to know about you. Once you are clear about your brand, you can shine the light of visibility on it, around it, and even through it to stand out from the competition. Remember, it's not what you do, but how you impact that defines your brand. Visibility might be internal or external, depending on where you are in your career and where you want to go. But it's difficult to move up or move out if no one knows how you've made tangible impacts to the organization. You want to leverage your differentiation. Rather than blending in, authentic branding helps you to stand apart from your competitors. I see hundreds of resumes every year, and most of them look very much alike. Graduated with a degree in accounting or finance, MBA, maybe a CPA, a stint in public accounting, then the traditional career climb, and all those responsibilities and duties. It's not the like things that garner attention, but the things that set you apart and which are rooted in your ability to solve problems and deliver value that differentiate you. It's almost impossible to be a purple cow when you look like all the other Guernseys in the field. I believe, excuse me, look at it this way. If a decision maker is looking at 10 resumes and they all look the same, degree in accounting or finance, MBA, maybe a CPA, a stint in public accounting, then the traditional career climb and all those responsibilities and duties. Why would you stand out? I believe it is the clear and compelling value proposition that is wrapped in an emotional connection with the reader that gets their attention. A candidate who is intriguing to an interviewer is the candidate who relates to that interviewer from an emotional brand persona perspective. Recruiters all have the same square peg, square hole mentality. A clear and compelling, visible branded value proposition makes their job of filling square holes with square pegs very easy. Fit remains the most difficult part of the hiring process. So let's look at some stats 
that really speak to the executive fail rate. According to Execunet, there is an overall 40% fail rate. And Manchester, Inc. says that 40% of newly promoted managers and executives fail within 18 months of starting a new job. Half of the process users, so both managers and new hires, later regret their buying decision. 25% of new hires regret taking their new job within one year, according to Challenger Gray. 58% of the highest priority hires, those are new executives hired from the outside, fail in their new position within 18 months. 46% of U.S. new hires must be classified as failures because within their first 18 months, they were either fired, pressured to quit, or required disciplinary action. And nearly half of new executive hires quit or are fired within the first 18 months at a new employer, according to Corporate Leadership Council. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that these failed turnover rates are solely due to poor fit. But I am suggesting that we ought not to continue to add poor fit as one of the reasons for failure. Not only is it very costly for employers, but it dumps candidates right back into the job hunt with the taint of job hopping as a real perception. So how is branded visibility good for your career? I call these the three C's. Branding delivers a crystal clear message. You understand your value, and you know how to deliver that message clearly and succinctly. One of the problems with far too many candidates is that who they are and how they deliver is not clear. Listen, if you aren't clear about what your value is and who would benefit from it, the person reading your resume is not going to figure it out for you. You have to know those two things, what your value is, and who needs it, and then play in that space. While it seems counterintuitive to go narrow and deep versus throwing your resume at anything and everything that might be a fit, it really is a much better and more effective strategy. If your message is clear and your target is defined and you have visibility, your branded value proposition will resonate with the right people which brings me to compelling. You bring something a company wants and or needs wrapped in the authenticity of, the, of your brand. Once you have clarity on where your value lies, you can make your value proposition compelling by using emotional brand attributes that speak directly to your target audience. Let's go back to the truth teller brand persona. They have impeccable honesty, are sincere and trustworthy, and the C-suite board and investors know they can count on what the truth teller says. Those attributes resonate with people for whom truth matters. Strong, compelling brands attract the right opportunities and repel those that are not a good fit. A truth teller isn't going to attract opportunities from companies who have shady practices. That's not who the company wants, and it certainly isn't where the truth teller wants to land. Being well branded for the right opportunities can actually lower those executive fail rates we talked about earlier. Again, while it might sound counterintuitive to stand strong and clear to a specific audience, it helps to ensure that you land in the right place instead of a place you are delivering a laser-focused message to a clearly defined audience. And once you have a clear, compelling message, you deliver the same message consistently and constantly. Your consistent message is constantly visible to your target audience. The build it and they will come philosophy doesn't apply to your brand. Just having a brand that isn't constantly and consistently visible to your target audience is akin to not having a brand. 
And like other good things in your life, if you have to work, you have to work at maintaining that constant visibility. Here's an easy example, LinkedIn. Many, many finance executives either have no presence on LinkedIn or their profile is incomplete and anything but compelling. Or they build it and now they're ignoring it. The very term social media implies there is a social aspect to it, which implies there's action. Even if you choose not to engage in social media, which I don't recommend, you still need to constantly and consistently raise your visibility in your local market and among your face-to-face -face market. Constancy is a process. It's a long-term career management strategy, and it is one that can keep you being hunted as a passive candidate rather than having to become the hunter as one of many unemployed job search candidates. I have a couple of stories that I want to share with you that will illustrate how authentic branding actually translates to a tangible outcome. First, there is the attraction phenomenon. As we just discussed, having branded visibility attracts the right opportunities your way. This is a passive candidate who would like to move, but doesn't have to move, and certainly not anytime soon. He has the luxury of selectively waiting for the exact right opportunity. And because of his branded compelling profile on LinkedIn, he is the pursued, desired, passive candidate. What is also interesting about him is that he defies the industry expertise myth. His background is retail, and he has been recruited for numerous positions with multi-unit healthcare facilities. His skills are transferable, and his clear branded value proposition speaks directly to that point. With branded visibility, instead of playing the posted position game, where you throw your resume at anything and everything that might be a fit, you have positioning as a subject matter expert within a defined area that is appealing to a clear target audience. Again, at the risk of beating the dead horse, Branded visibility is a long-term career management strategy. Once you are branded and visible, you maintain that visibility, remember constancy, giving yourself continued leverage as the hunter rather than the, the hunted rather than the hunter. In addition to attracting the right opportunities, branded visibility also facilitates the power of passive positioning. Of all my branding clients, I have to say this client took to branding like a duck to water. Another passive candidate, his company wanted him to stay and made him a very nice offer, but the outside offers kept rolling in. When he went on interviews, his passionate zeal just oozed through. And often the interview turned into a lively conversation around the value of branding. <clears throat> this gentleman is truly authentic and exudes, lives, his brand on and off the job. He has become one of my most vocal advocates for branding. It's very difficult to make a move to the CFO slot if you haven't held the CFO slot title in the past. Because of his very bold brand, nonetheless, he was offered a regional CFO position based in Hong Kong. Since World Citizen is one of his brand personas, he truly has found the perfect fit while achieving his dream of becoming a chief financial officer. And by the way, this client is the charming brainiac. Interestingly, the company who made the offer that he accepted <clears throat> included fit for culture as front and center to their hiring decision my client was the perfect fit for their culture. And fit for culture is the most tangible outcome of authentic, visible branding. Establishing your authentic brand has to do with perception, other perception. 
Honest feedback from those who know you is critically important. I believe that information is best elicited through the use of a 360 assessment, which is designed specifically to look at four areas, leadership competencies, key attributes, strengths, and weaknesses. And that it needs to be a true 360, not a 180, meaning it must be internal and external. That is important because we're searching for authenticity, those same attributes the people with whom you work and the people with whom you play all see in you. That is the basis for an authentic brand versus an image. And feedback must be confidential to ensure integrity of the data. When you are one of the top three candidates, there are only two questions still on the table, likability and culture fit. Your ability to do the job is already answered. Being authentically branded takes the fit question off the table, too. You go into the interview knowing you fit within their culture and knowing that they know that as well. If you like them and they like you, the decision-making process is much easier and much faster. After going through the 360 assessment, one of my clients said that it was one of the most valuable exercises he had ever gone through. Here's his amazing story. He's in a rather niche space, and one day in early October, he walked into the bank. One of the officials greeted him, took him aside, and said that one of his other customers had an opening for a CFO, and he thought my client would be a perfect fit. Turns out he was. Three weeks later, he had a written offer, took a long vacation, and was on board by the end of November. It was the perfect fit culturally, as well as for his skills and leadership competencies. What's also noteworthy about this client is that he's very competitive in sports and actually leveraged the competitiveness, discipline, and commitment to his sport as part of his brand appeal. It worked beautifully, since now he is playing in the space both as a hobby and working in that space as a CFO. Which brings me to the last but equally beneficial outcome. Like my client above, passionate fit is at the core of executive branding. It showcases your fit within an organization, but it also serves as a guide for you in assessing a move into that right position. Notice the last sentence on the quote, love going to work again. How many people wish they could say that about something they do in excess of 60 hours every week? When you are authentically branded, clear about your compelling value, and visible to a defined, targeted audience, your chances of landing those dream jobs increase exponentially. So here's the bottom line. Today, it is incumbent upon CFOs and finance executives on the way to the C-suite to recognize that proactive career management is critically important and that your brand, compelling value proposition, and reputation are your most valuable assets. However, if no one knows how great you are, it doesn't matter how great you are. Competition isn't going to lessen in the future. In fact, it will probably increase as the economy continues to flail. Ensuring that you understand your branded value proposition and that you control the message to your targeted audience is key to being the coveted and desired perfect candidate, being courted for the right fit for both the candidate and the company. And with that, Ernie, I believe we have some poll questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Cindy, for that uh, compelling and thought-provoking content. Uh, Cindy mentioned before we transition to the Q&A portion of the webinar, uh, we're going to launch a few polling questions. These are especially important uh, for those of you in the audience um, seeking CPE credit for today's event. So please be sure that you answer those polling questions. 
what I'll, what I'll do is I'll launch our first poll, leave it up a few minutes, and then launch the next poll. Uh, but, but as we do that, I'd like to go ahead and start uh, the Q&A session, given the, given the great opportunity that, that we have that we have to, to access uh, one, of, one, one of the leading um, experts uh, in this field. So, so I'll go ahead um, and do that. Uh, so, with, uh, so with that, um, Cindy, I'd like to tee up uh, our first question. Um, someone's um, asking about, you know, they, it seems as you're an advocate for 360 assessment and their company does these on a regular information. They're asking, uh, isn't that sufficient information um, for this assessment? Is, is this all that they need to do that? That's a really great, great question and it's actually one I get frequently. And the answer, sadly, is no. And I know companies pay big bucks for those 360 assessments that are really 180 assessments. So there's a couple of reasons why that assessment won't work. First of all, it is not designed to get the information that we need in branding. Secondly, it only measures internal feedback. And we really want internal and external. We're looking for those commonalities of attributes that people see in you regardless of where you are and who, with whom you're interacting. So internal and external, a true 360. And then finally, um, the, the purpose of, of this 360, um, I lost my train of thought here for a second. The purpose of the, the 360 that I use is because it allows you to look at the tool as a professional development tool. So it has nothing inside of it about careers or, or job hunting, career management or job hunting, but really is about the four areas that I mentioned, which is you know, the attributes, the leadership companies, competencies, your strengths, and your weaknesses. And the 360 assessment that I use actually um, generates from a web-based program. This was the other point I was going to make. It needs to be honest. Um, I think it's very difficult when you're measuring feedback from the people who report to you to really get that honest feedback because they're a little fearful of their job. But this program, because it, it sends the assessment out from the web and it gets the information back into the web and then actually um, analyzes the data and spits out about a 30-page report, it's confidential and you can actually get better, more honest feedback that can really help you in the course of not only creating your brand, but in being able to understand how to use your brand to leverage um, the power of your position in the boardroom, on the executive team, and even with your team. Okay, great. Um, thanks. I have a question around that. Uh, you mentioned how you want to uh, control uh, the first page of your Google search results. Can mm -hmm. you give us some brief tips on how you would go about uh, even, even looking at that and how you would take that control? Sure. Um, you know, it's a little sad that we are who Google says we are, but today that's really how the world operates. And so it is very important to be controlling the message that you want to be delivering. So I'm going to assume that, first of all, you understand what your brand is and what message it is that you're trying to convey. So we're going to go on that assumption. One of the first things that you can do is you can go to um, Google and put your name in quotes and see what is currently out there about you. Is it, is there anything? First question, is there anything? And second, if there is something, how much of it belongs to you? Of those 10 spots, how many do you take up? And, and then is the message consistent? So if, if it says that, you know, in, in, this is an extreme example, but I think it will get the point across. If you are very political, and, and if that's part of your brand, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm using it for purposes of this example. If you are very political and you have been in a public forum 
ranting and not in a very nice way or a respectable way. Um, you're passionate and your passion shows. Um, and Google picked that up. And on the flip side, you have this very um, conservative guy in the office who really doesn't speak very much. He keeps his opinion to himself. That's a very mixed message. And that's not a good message for you to have. You can be passionate. And that can be certainly a part of your brand. But whatever that message is that you want to have out there, you want it to be consistent and cohesive. So first, Google your name in quotes, in quotes so that it eliminates things that, um, so if I did Cindy Craft in quotes, it would not give me Cindy Smith and Craft Foods. It would give me only those things where my first name and my last name followed. Then you can go to a website called Addictomatic. Addict, A-D-D-I-C-T-O-Matic, M-A-T-I-C dot com. Addictomatic is a really good site for, again, measuring the influence that you have on the web. And because today Google reads images, it reads actually the meta tags on images to be um, at 100% correct. And it reads meta tags on videos. So if you have been a speaker at um, a conference or given workshops, and you've uploaded your slides to something you know, like SlideShare, which is attached to your LinkedIn profile, um, that will show up in Google. And, and when you're looking at a dictomatic, it's going to show all of the text places that you show up, all of the images with your name, all of the videos, all of the um, PowerPoint presentations. So a dictomatic allows you to look at it from a really more balanced approach. Maybe there's a couple of articles and nothing else. Um, maybe there's um, a couple of pictures, but they're pictures uh, that are very casual of you and not really reflecting the um, executive aura that you want to be a part of your brand. So a dictomatic can really help you figure out where you might be lacking and if you appear, where you might need some balance to get it back to your branded message. And then really controlling Google. Um, LinkedIn is, is obviously where you want to be. Um, if you are on Twitter, your tweets are picked up. If you write articles, you can link them back to your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you blog or you have a personal website, personal portfolio online, those are all ways that you can control those first uh, 10 slots on the first page of Google. OK, great. Uh, great answer. Uh, with question um, around uh, a couple around on the resumes. So, so someone's um, asking, uh, you know, how do you best, uh, best blend branding of yourself uh, into your resume? That's part one. Uh, and then part two, uh, I might add, is, is kind of around uh, the most, I mean, how do you set yourself apart uh, in your resume? You say, as finance and accounting executives, we see, you know, you see the same old, same old. So what are some areas or, or, or what is it that can set the resume apart both visually and content-wise? OK. So going back to my, um, my Brainiac client, his brand profile opens his resume. And we have then incorporated his brand throughout the resume. So remember, your value proposition is factual. It's how you impact. Your brand is the, is the emotional piece that, tell, that, that wraps around that in, in your personal style of how you deliver. So because we knew what his brand was, and charming was a big piece of his brand, you know, being nice, being able to um, nudge people in the direction that they, they need to go in, in a way that is just, um, they wanted to go just because they wanted to be around him. Um, so so um, his resume opens with a brand profile, but then we weave that emotional connection throughout the rest. So with regard to how you stand out in your resume, here's what I always tell people. You are not being hired because there's a corner office with a beautiful view 
it's got a plaque on the door and it needs a body sitting in the chair behind the desk. You are being hired because you can solve problems. And when you position yourself as a problem solver, that's a big piece of the relating part. So if you're sitting in an interview and, and the interviewer sees, and this is also a part of your conversation in answering interview question, um, the interviewer sees that you have been able to solve the kinds of problems that the company is having, that's, that's a connection. That's, that's a candidate who, who speaks to their pain, who makes the relation, versus the candidate whose resume is replete with responsibilities and duties. It's assumed, if you're a CFO, that there are things that you have done in your past that have gotten you to that CFO role. Now, you can't not include anything. You do have to have a brief synopsis that allows a recruiter to understand the level of your um, executive positioning. But when it comes down to somebody looking for a candidate who can come in and take away their pain, the very best way to stand out in a resume is to position yourself as a problem solver. And front and center, you are a problem solver that can take away a company's pain. That's a huge, that's the purple cow in a field of Guernseys. Okay, um, yeah, that that's great. Um, I, I have a, this is a, there's some really interesting questions coming here. I hate to say that, but there are some really interesting questions. Um, one of them um, is around um, how do you control uh, the visual perception? So, what are the mistakes and key pieces of advice that you have on that front? And kind of a related question is, you know, is do you want to include photos um, in your LinkedIn profile and other ways in, when you're positioning your brand? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand how do you control the visual perception. Um, uh, I, I guess I – go ahead. I, I think that's a rather broad question, so okay. I'm, not, I'm not exactly right, yeah. sure what the point is. Maybe who's ever asking that could um, give a little bit of detail, and I'll answer the LinkedIn question, and then sure, we'll come yeah, back to I that mean, one. Is that okay? Right. Go ahead. Sure. Um, absolutely, positively. Yes, you want a professional headshot on your LinkedIn profile. Think of it this way. LinkedIn is a networking platform. Translate that to what you would do offline. So offline, you would walk into a networking event, and you would have a name tag, and you would have face-to-face -face conversations with people. What you would not do is put a brown paper bag over your head, not wear a name tag, not hand out business cards, and not stand by the wall as a wallflower. You wouldn't even be able to enjoy the food and the beverage. And so LinkedIn is really the online version of an offline networking platform. And so the things that you would do offline really translate to LinkedIn the same way that People like to do business with people that, that they know and trust, and part of that is having a face with a name, is having that headshot on LinkedIn so that when somebody looks at you, they see your face, they see a headline, i.e. not your current job title, and then they see that little synopsis in the blue box that gives kind of a, a quick picture of you. But your photo, is critically important to LinkedIn. Having a complete profile on LinkedIn is, is really important in the context of search results. If you have an incomplete profile, your search results will not be 100%. So you might be the most qualified person, but an incomplete profile means that if a recruiter does a keyword search, you're not going to come to the top, even if you have all the keywords, because your profile is incomplete. So there's a couple of really good reasons for having a photo on LinkedIn. Okay, great. Oh, we got time for a few more questions, and I'll come back to the to the visual perception question here if we have time. Okay. At the end. Um, 
this is a really uh, this was running through my mind uh, as well uh, in that you mentioned how to do that 360 assessment um, outside you know, kind of an inside and outside 360 assessment um, how do you how do you get folks to deliver those honest answers to you so how do you position that to them and get that honesty that you really need mm hmm you know, one of the most fascinating things about this 360 is how much people love to do it. I have actually had clients who did it, and then their uh, colleagues and the executive team also did it because they, they, just, they were fascinated by the assessment and the report that was generated. So um, what I recommend that my clients do is to send out a little email to their list of people and say, you know, I'm doing this 360 assessment. I'm looking for some real honest feedback so I can be a better chief financial officer and really would value your honest feedback. Um, you'll be getting an email from this website and the information, uh, the feedback that you deliver is sent right back to the, the website. I don't see it individually, it's compiled and analyzed and provides me the feedback that I need. So the, the taking, the assessment rate is, is upwards of typically 60% for people who send out the assessment to their people to take. It's, it's a very high, oftentimes it can be as high as 75 or 80%. It's a very fun assessment, it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes. And it, it is just, it's, um, it's interesting to the person who's taking it, but it's also intriguing when they see what comes out the other end. Okay, I think we'll um, have uh, one final question uh, on this site. Um, what would you say again, uh, what are the, the three to five most um, common mistakes uh, that you see people making or the areas uh, that someone hasn't given this adequate, adequate attention needs to start and avoid uh, those mistakes and also how to avoid uh, becoming invisible, as you say. So three to five common mistakes in branding? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think one of the most common is, is the one that I started out with. It's confusing what branding is with what branding is not. And, you know, when my colleagues are, are telling people that your brand is, you know, rewrite your resume every time you send it out so that your brand fits with what they're looking for, um, that's, that's wrong information, that's bad information, and the people that are following it are probably just as frustrated as those who aren't using branding. So. Um, not knowing what it is, not knowing how to use it. You know, branding branding is hard work. Figuring out your brand is hard work. It, it's, it isn't just that you can say, you know, I am this really cool finance guy and everybody loves me and be that persona because behind your back, that may really not be what people are saying. And so, Branding, the branding process is hard work. It, the ROI is, is quite high because it allows a candidate to, to be very differentiated, but to be very authentic to how they're wired and how they work and how they delivered, how they deliver and, and how that translates to moving into the right corporate culture. Um, and then I think that, you know, another common mistake is, is not driving the message. Um, I said this in the webinar as well. You can have a great brand, but if nobody knows about your brand, it doesn't matter. And with social media and the way that viral marketing works, it's very important that you live your brand. You exude it in everything that you do, everywhere that you go, and with every group of people with, with whom you interact. And so it is very important that it be authentic, that it be authentic to the people in the workplace and it be authentic to the people in your church, be authentic to the friends that you go out with. That's where 
living your brand becomes like your skin. So there isn't anything that you have to do to be a brand. Your brand is who you are. It's how you live. It's what you do. And because you're exuding it, everybody sees it. You're known as. You're, you're, when somebody thinks of you, they think of this particular brand persona that accompanies you. I mean, I'm known as Cindy Craft, the CFO coach. And CFO coach is more of a niche than it is a brand, but it has become my brand. It's almost that nobody says Cindy Craft whoa, there's part of my name missing. So when you're wearing your brand, it becomes a natural part of you that is in everything that you do, and you exude it constantly. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cindy. With that, I'd like to close uh, the Q&A session uh, portion of the webinar. Um, we'd like to thank Cindy Kraft for her time and insight. If you would like us to connect you uh, with Cindy, please indicate that on the survey. We will invite you to take uh, later this afternoon. We're always looking to get better. I know Cindy is a leader in this field and an excellent source of information now on today's topics. Uh, also, another note, uh, for those of you looking for CPE credits, please send an email to Tanya Walsh, T. Walsh at performative.com in order to receive your CPE certificate. Again, we will be sending the slides out to you this afternoon, or link to the slides this afternoon, and you can grab Tanya's email off there if you have uh, CPE questions. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the audience for your valuable time, and we hope to see you on performative.com and at future events. Uh, make it a great day, everyone, and everyone have a great weekend.